and uh, we're going to talk about the history of money, where money comes from, and, and a bunch of topics, some of which have been delineated by um, David, David Sosin from uh, uh, Costa Rica, uh, who has sponsored the show. And you, know, you guys can sponsor shows too. Money. Let's talk about money. Um, so the question really here is the history of money um, and its present and its future. So there's a lot to talk about here. But so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the history, even though um, the history of money going way back, uh, build it up to a discussion of fiat money, which David certainly wants me to talk about. Uh, in terms of, um, um, uh, you know, the questions he's asked what, about fiat money. We'll talk about gold. We'll talk about the gold standard. Um, we'll also talk about uh, investment, different investment vehicles. Uh, I'll say something about Keynes. Um, yeah, and we'll see what else we cover. But, but, but let's just start uh, with the basics. And... You know, it's really, really important to note that money of one form or another has existed. Uh, we have evidence that has existed in human civilization for thousands of years. Um, money goes certainly goes back to Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, actually, Mesopotamia had not just money, but also interest. At a rate of interest, they charged people interest on loans. There was an active lending business. There were money lenders in Mesopotamia. Uh, Mesopotamia is the empire that is in what is today Iraq, Iran, that part of the world. And, and it's, it's probably maybe the first civilization together with Egypt, maybe the first civilization uh, that we have. And it, it was, it's clear, you know, it's the first system of law was Hammurabi's laws. Uh, tablets of actual rule of law, of, of articulations of, of, of what the laws are that govern the land. And it's clear in that environment that loans were made. Now, loans were not necessarily made in a monetary unit. Uh, some loans were made in terms of um, uh, stuff. So you could, for example, loan somebody seeds and you would demand interest on the seeds. That is, you would expect that uh, they would return the seeds with interest, which means if you gave them 100 seeds, you want back 150 seeds. That would be 50% or whatever, whatever it happens to be. So, um, you know, you can, you can find on these tablets transactions like that and, and commemorations of that. Now, remember, human society, certainly 10, 15,000 years ago, maybe more, was, was a barter society. You exchange goods for goods, things for things. Uh, it, it's, and, and of course, exchanging goods for goods is very cumbersome. It's very difficult. Uh, it is, uh, it is um, you know, how many, how many chickens is a cow? And if I don't have enough chickens, do I get, do I get half a cow, but half a cow is worth less, a lot less than half a cow because a cow is alive, half a cow is dead. So it's, it's very, it's, it's, a barter economy is a very, very difficult economy. It's a very slow economy. It's a very inefficient economy. And it's an economy that cannot, cannot really grow. It's an economy that is, cannot really increase in productivity. Uh, but productivity is stalled. When there is no unit that allows something that allows for, uh, you know, simplified exchange. And the first money came into being in order to simplify exchange. And that money could have been a, a, a lot of different things, right? And indeed, lots of things over the millennia have served as money from uh, rocks with unique shapes to um, agricultural products to precious metals. And, uh, ooh, we just had a, 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 a membership gifted. Thank you, Apollo Zeus. Nate is the beneficiary 
of a uh, of a membership gift from Apollo Zeus. Very nice. So you can imagine that at some point there was something, a precious metal, uh, uh, some kind of uh, a, a relatively rare and exclusive crop that a lot of people want it. Not everybody needs it, but a lot of people want it so that I might not want it, but I knew that I could trade it for something one of you want. That one of you wanted and I could trade it to you for what something that I did want. So what you actually got is, uh, is some means of exchange, a, a, some commodity, some thing that we could, that could be used to place a monetary value, to place a price on every good in this primitive economy so that barter didn't have to happen. Instead, we could use this medium of exchange to move product to whoever wanted it most. And how would you know who wanted it most? The one who was willing to pay the most in this medium of exchange. And a medium of exchange is money. Money is, the, the definition of money is really the, the prevalent, the, the, the used means of exchange, the, the thing that we use to, to, to get to trade, to facilitate, smooth out, a barter system of trade. Right. So a barter system evolved into a money system. A money system is a lot more effective, and ultimately, that money system, uh, you know, uh, organized around two types of money: uh, 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 commodities, basically, uh, silver and gold. And uh, people would literally use gold, gold coins, or, or, you know, gold dust or gold bars. You'd have to weigh it. You'd have to evaluate. You know, the nice thing about coins is you knew its nomination. As long as it wasn't chipped, as, one, as long as it was whole, you knew what it was going to weigh because it came with a stamp that uh, the mint had authorized that this is what it weighed. And so money could be, uh, so gold could be used if I wanted to buy your cow or you wanted to buy my chickens. We didn't have to exchange cows for chickens. We just exchanged money for each, for, for the commodity or the product or the agricultural product that we needed. And the reason gold evolved or, or silver evolved is because they were not perishable. You, you wanted to be able to keep it to use when you needed something. And so in, in a sense, they needed to be a store of value. And if they perished, they couldn't be a store of value. And they need to be a store of value so that they could be used as a medium of exchange. So they needed to be, uh, they, they couldn't be perishable. Uh, they needed to be relatively rare. So you couldn't just flood the market with them. Because what happens if you flood the market? What happens if there's X amount of gold in, in, in this economy? being traded and a certain number of goods. And suddenly somebody brings in or somebody helicopters drops from the sky enough gold to double the amount of gold that exists in this economy. Is everybody now richer? Well, not really, because now they have more money to spend on the same goods they will just bid up the price of those goods. This is what's called price inflation. They'll bid up the price of those goods and they'll have the same stuff. Now, to the extent that gold is stuff, maybe they're richer because they have more gold. But if gold's primary function is just as a medium of exchange, then it's the stuff they're exchanging for that is what's making them richer or poorer. So gold and silver were relatively rare, difficult to find. They, were, uh, they didn't perish. 
They were doable, doable, doable. They could be, they could be subdivided. That that is, you could melt them and turn them into coins of various weights, which represented various values. So they were, relatively speaking, to the alternatives, easy to transport, easy to give change. <laughs> right, if you're buying something, you want to be able to get change if you've got a high dominate denomination. Gold is homogeneous, it's all the same. So it's homogeneous, divisible, it's non-perishable, it's, uh, sust it's sustainable, it's, but it's relatively rare. So this is what, this is why gold made good money. This is why gold made good money um, in, in, uh, in the past. Now, the system evolved because the reality of it was that carrying around gold was cumbersome. It's heavy. Carrying around gold is also susceptible to theft, particularly if you have to move the gold over vast distances, for example, for trade, international trade. So, uh, you know, in, in starting with you know, the establishment of international trade, uh, which was already prevalent in, in, in Greece, and there was already, there were things called bills of exchange. There were, in a sense, these financial institutions in two different locations that had a relationship. And I could give my gold payment for your materials to institution A, they would be responsible for getting it to institution B. Institution B would be, would, would, it would be enough for them to get a piece of paper from institution A saying, yes, we got the gold, we're holding it for you, give this person the goods that, that they are purchasing, and the goods would flow. So you can see how you didn't have to wait for the gold to actually get to the new person and gold to move around the economy. What you had were these bills of exchange moving around, which were basically promissory notes that the gold was in safekeeping and you will get that gold. And, and this is kind of the beginning of, of uh, a banking. And there's a sense in which these are loans. And they were discounted. And that discount could be viewed as interest as because if I'm doing the service for you, you need to pay me to do this service for you. I'm holding your gold for you, and I'll get it to you, you know, safely and conveniently. But what really happened as a consequence is these bills of exchange now in some way become like money. I, I can trade the bills of exchange. Because anybody who holds this bill, well, that bank A is supposed to deliver them the money. So... Merchants could swap bills of exchange. They could use bills of exchange to trade goods among themselves. So you can see it's the beginning of a paper money, but the paper is not money. The paper is what we call money substitute. The paper is a money representative. It represents money. It represents the gold that's held in the vault somewhere that you can have access to, that you can use this paper to get to. And, and, and it's a massive innovation. And, and this was very prevalent in, um, in, in, in the Renaissance and, and uh, banks like the Medici Bank in uh, Florence and other banks in Italy uh, that were bigger than Medici but less famous. And Holland, which turned into uh, the Netherlands, turned into a major banking hub. Basically, most of what they did was trade in these um, uh, you know, uh, uh, trade in these IOUs, trade in these uh, uh, IOUs that made global trade possible. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of trust involved because it's hard to, it, 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 it is very hard, and, and there were big discounts as a consequence, but it's very hard to enforce these contracts. Uh, Partially because it's global, so there's no enforcing mechanism because, uh, you know, one city-state is, is trading with another city-state, 
And how do I enforce stuff in another city state? But you have to develop trust. Trust has developed. And of course, part of that trust is fulfilling your obligations. And as and, and there's a of course profit to be made by fulfilling your obligations. If you steal, you only steal once. You never get an opportunity to steal a second time because nobody will do business with you a second time. Now, uh, you know, modern banking really starts and modern money really starts with um, goldsmiths in, in Northern Europe. Uh, people, when people start accumulating wealth, so now it's not just trade, but people start accumulating wealth and they have a hard time transporting the wealth or they have an even hard time storing their wealth. Where do they put it? Dig a hole in the backyard? Do they, uh, uh, do they uh, put it in some kind of vaults? And they, and all of that is dangerous. People can steal it. People can take it. So what happens is they go to the goldsmiths and say, hey, goldsmiths, would you be willing to store this for me? Uh, you know, you guys can build a serious vault. You guys can hire security. Please store this. And basically, they stored it, and the goldsmiths would give them an IOU for it. And they would hold the IOU, and uh, if they ever needed gold, they would go to the goldsmith and cash in the IOU. Well, over time, what they discovered was that they could use that IOU to buy stuff particularly if the IU is denominated in small amounts rather than one big one. And they could, because the IOU could be used by anybody. It wasn't person specific. It basically said, this is an innovation, a development, the bank or the goldsmith will give X amount of gold to the bearer of this note. Not to Joe Schmo, but to the bearer of the note. So Joe Schmo could go trade with Sam Wham, and Sam Wham could take the, 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 the note into the goldsmith and get his gold. So you got here the, beginning, the, 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 the beginnings of paper money, not bills of exchange, but now it was literal IOUs, deposit slips, if you will. And over time, they became known as banknotes. Banknotes. Really, the bank how you use. We've got your gold. We'll give it to whoever hands this banknote to us. Now, of course, you had to protect those banknotes. <laughs> you don't want to lose them because anybody could use them. But they were a lot easier, a lot more comfortable to move around, to move from place to place, to exchange than sacks of gold. You didn't have to carry sacks of gold in your pocket. You just carry some notes, easier to protect. Uh, now, another development happened at the same time. The goldsmiths realized that they had all this gold sitting in their vaults. And it wasn't being withdrawn that often. People were not coming and demanding all their gold be taken out. And the gold was sitting there. And yet, clearly, there were people out there in the world who wanted loans, who wanted, in a sense, gold to be able to go and buy stuff or start businesses or, you know, primarily start businesses or start a farm or start something like that. And they were sitting on all this gold, and it was kind of a waste. Why not, they said to themselves lend this gold out to people who want to start businesses and charge interest for it. Of course, they had been charging interest from the people who deposited gold with them. They'd been charging them a fee. So if, uh, I, if I'm the goldsmith and you want to store the gold with me, I'm going to charge you a fee. I'm not going to pay you interest. You're going to pay me because I'm giving you a service. Now, if I can use your money while it's stored with me to make loans over there, 
then I want to attract more people to give me their gold and to give me their money so I can make more loans out there. So maybe now I offer a free, free service where you can deposit gold with me and I won't charge you anything. Or maybe I'll even give you a half a percent or a percent or whatever. And people start giving me more gold. I lend it all out. And of course, you can see that there's a bit of a problem here. Because if they're giving me the gold with the anticipation that they can withdraw it at any time, and I'm giving it out on the other side and charging interest on the other side, there could be a day where everybody wants their gold at the same time, and I don't have enough gold in my vault because I've lent it all out or I've lent enough of it out that I can't pay you enough. And as a consequence, that's called a bank run, and a bank can go bankrupt because of that. That is a liquidity crisis. Now, bankers are pretty smart about this, and they make you sign a contract when you deposit your money in a bank that says sometimes on occasion they will have to tell you you cannot get your money. They immediately, you will have to wait a while. They can freeze your account for a while. And you accept that. Or not. <laughs> or you don't use the bank. So it's not fraud. It's all up front. Everybody knows this is going on. They also got smart about, hmm, we should probably keep a healthy reserve. That is, we should keep a lot of gold in the vault. We shouldn't loan it all out. If we loan it all out, we could get in real trouble if somebody comes and wants their gold back. So a kind of a market equilibrium sets in where some banks might loan more out, some banks might loan less out. That will determine how risky the bank is. But you can see now that overall, gold is not going to move much, really. What is going to move? All those banknotes. I come give the bank my gold. They give me banknotes. The banknote says redeemable in gold. I use those notes to buy stuff. And the bank, when it makes a loan on the other side, doesn't literally give somebody the gold. They give them banknotes. And maybe the person on the other side takes those banknotes and they deposit those banknotes with another bank. Then that other bank demands that your bank send the gold over there. They basically redeem the banknotes, and that's when the gold might move. But generally, the economy is an economy of notes, money, what we call paper money, but paper money that's all redeemable into gold or silver. And the gold and silver is moving, but it's moving in the background between financial institutions. We are not really, mostly, not touching it. And this is, of course, an incredibly efficient system. It has all the benefits of gold in the sense that it's, again, doable, not perishable. There's not a lot of it. Not a lot is discovered any given year. So you don't get these floods of money coming in. Yet it does facilitate things like fractional reserve banking, which increases the amount of can during increased economic activity, increasing the amount of money in the economy, which is not a bad thing. So there is a lot of banknotes floating around, and that's what we use. And that's what the essence of a gold-backed financial system is. It's, it's private banks issuing currency. Now, the first changes to this happen when we get central banks. Kind of the first central bank is the Bank of Amsterdam. Um, but the first really active, the, 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 the real model for central banking is the Bank of England. Uh, that was established, I think, in the 18th century. And uh, these banks, they take it upon themselves. See, the problem with gold as money and, and this private system of private banks, free banking, notes moving around is there could be periods where there seems to be a shortage of money, where people have used their gold, let's say, to buy stuff from other countries, the gold has all gone to, to France. 
No new gold is coming into the United States because nobody's buying UK stuff. And, and, and there could be these movements of gold, which means money, and you could have periods in which there's less money in the economy. That might lead to price declines, just like inflation, when there's a lot, an increase in the money, but no increase in production, leads to inflation. A decrease in the money, but the same number of goods would, it would lead to what's called deflation, a decrease in prices. Well, central banks are established in order to smooth that out. So they can kind of issue, they can issue money still supposedly backed by gold, but they can like cheat for a while. Like during periods where more money is needed than the gold exists, they can print more with the idea that later on when gold adjusts, they can take money out of the economy to, to, to return to equilibrium. So the idea of central banking is the gold standard works, but it's kind of messy. And it relies on uncoordinated private individuals making decisions and private institutions making decisions. That feels uncomfortable, particularly to a statist, right? It feels, it feels like we could do better. So the way to do better is we can centralize this, organize this, and you know, do it in a way that do it in a way that really smooths out the ups and downs of what's called the business cycle of periods in which prices might be going up or prices might be going down uh, and uh, credit might be available and then credit might not be available. Uh, you know, interest rates, for example, instead of having them set by a marketplace and they're fluctuating over time without any supervision and nobody deciding about them, now we can control interest rates. It just gives the authorities the government, a huge amount of power, leverage over the economy. And that's what central banks are instituted for. They were instituted for the purpose of power and leverage over the markets, over the economy. What is more powerful than having control over the money when money is needed for every trade? Money is needed for every transaction. Money kind of is needed for all economic activity. Now, central banks, of course, are limited, though, because while they can cheat on the money, on, on the amount of money they issue vis-a-vis -vis the gold they have, they can't cheat too much. People will discover, and if they issue more dollar, more money than there is gold they will be ultimately, th those pieces of paper will devalue, will look, come down in value, and that will cause inflation. That is, you'll need more of the pieces of paper, more money to buy any good. These are not, it's not real money, it's money substitutes, the real money is the gold. So they have to be stealthy, they have to be, it's difficult. It's difficult to do. And it's limiting, because ultimately, you want to get it back into equilibrium, and and that isn't always, you know, that, that, that's not always how central banks want to behave. In a sense, it, what they want is power. They get power, but the power is constrained by the amount of gold in their vault. And if the gold in the vault is diminishing, then the amount of money circulating should be diminished. And yet they don't want it to diminish. Because they want to keep the economy, they, they, they want to pretend that the money's not flowing out, that gold is not flowing out, even though gold flowing out is not, it's not a bad thing. Deflation is not a bad thing, right? Let's, let's be clear for a minute about deflation, inflation. When it comes to prices, inflation means prices are rising. Deflation means prices are coming down. If deflation is a consequence of 
more goods than the, and, and, uh, the, the number of goods is, is growing faster than the amount of money. Productivity is increasing relative to the amount of money or because of international trade flows, then prices going down is not a bad thing. For example, if, if, if gold is flowing out of the economy from England, to, from England to France, and as a consequence of that, prices in England start going down, then the French look at prices in England and they start buying stuff from England because prices are cheap. Remember, there's a global currency. It's called gold. <laughs> Once they start buying goods from England, gold flows back to England. And the more gold flows back to England, everything else held constant, of course, prices come back up. So there's nothing wrong with prices adjusting to the quantity of money that's available and to the influence of global trade. It's completely natural, completely part of the free market. But it's not what central bankers or governments want. They want stability. They want control. So they intervene. And by intervening, they create dramatic distortions. But as much as they intervene, as much as they intervene, they're constrained about how much they can intervene by the fact that they still have gold. Gold is still money. Everybody views it as money. So central bankers have a huge incentive to get rid of gold to get rid of gold so that they can just, just have the paper and forget about the real money and make the paper money. And if they can make the paper money, i.e. the paper becomes the actual means of exchange, they can print up as much as they want. They can withdraw as much money as they want. They can play around with it as much as they want. There's no limit. There's no constraints. Really, the first experiment with fiat money, that is money divorced from a commodity, money divorced from a standard, money that is just paper. The first experiments with this were, were I read in actually in China in the 13th century. A number of Chinese emperors used this. I don't know the history of what happened in China. I can imagine, but I don't know the history. But the first real experiment with this was in the West was in France in the early part of the 18th century. A guy named John Law had a new monetary theory. Call it the modern monetary theory. It was modern back then. And uh, he believed that central banks and governments should be unconstrained in terms of issuing money, in terms of issuing currency. And indeed, he believed that the problem with the economies of the world in the 18th century was that there was not enough money. They were being limited by the limited supply of gold. Instead of viewing money as just a medium of exchange, not as a, you know, a, a good in and of itself. No, you know, law and others started viewing money as, as wealth. If I can print up more money, if I can print up more wealth, then I become wealthier, and the economy will do better. By the way, pretty much the entire Western world is run by that view today. It, John Law is considered by most, econ by, by most monetarist economists today as a uh, you know, father, in a sense, of modern central banking, and, and as a hero, almost as a hero, as a genius economist. By the way, just as an aside, I see Apollo Zeus is making a bunch of membership, uh, 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 of, of gifting memberships. Uh, thank you, Apollo. Uh, this is expensive. This is not cheap. So uh, I hope you guys are getting memberships. Appreciate that. You should thank, uh, you thank Apollo. I see that uh, Jennifer also gifted, did a uh, membership gifting. So thank you. Uh, it's, it's a nice way to support the show and to support the people in the chat who are part of the show. Um, it doesn't add up to the super chat, but it, it still is um, does add up, in a sense, uh, to the income on a monthly basis. 
So John Law uh, had these theories about money. Uh, he tried to implement them in, um, in uh, the UK and Scotland, where he was from, and uh, England. And he, he was ridiculed, and he, he, he actually got into a duel, and he killed a man, and he was tried, and he was sentenced to death at the age of 23. And uh, his friends managed to uh, uh, free him from jail. You know, they, they basically organized a jailbreak. And he escaped from jail, and he ultimately landed up in France, where he uh, became friendly with a lot of the French aristocrats. And France was going through a very difficult time at the time. The French monarchy, uh, the Louis XIV had just died. Louis XV was still a young boy. There was a, what do you call it, when a king is too young to rule. Anyway, uh, during Louis XIV's era, the monarchy had accumulated huge amounts of debt, huge amounts of debt. And it couldn't pay them. And it didn't want to default. This is France, after all. Regency, thank you, Mary Elaine. He was the regent. There was a regent. John Law befriended the regent and convinced him to experiment with this new form of money, fiat money. He basically got the region to approve a bank, which John Law owned, that would have the ability to print bills of exchange that would be accepted by the government in payment of taxes and in payment of other stuff. Uh, and you could use those bills of exchange, for example, to, to uh, uh, pay for the debts that the government had. Uh, so John Law started printing money, not initially backed by gold, but then ultimately completely detached from gold. He also st uh, started a company that initially was responsible for all the trade with the French, uh, uh, all trade in, emanating from the French territories in the United States. It was called the Mississippi Company. And, uh, Mississippi Company or Louisiana Company? Now I'm confused. I, I've forgotten. Anyway, one of the two. Uh, that company then landed up getting from the king the monopoly rights of all foreign trade with, uh, that France had with its colonies. And what this company did was it started issuing shares. It would issue shares to the public. The public would pay with real money. The, the uh, company would use that money to pay off the debts of the monarchy while issuing more and more shares. And of course, it was all associated with this bank that was issuing all of these notes. And the idea was the notes were good because you could use the notes to buy shares. So it was like this. Ponzi pyramid scheme, very complicated, very complex. But basically, fiat money was being issued throughout the French economy with the promise that it could be used to buy shares of this company that everybody wanted because its price was only going up, just like some stocks I know today. And everybody wanted it because, you know, the French government would take it. And of course, all this money was being issued. And ultimately, what happened was you got two things, which you always get when money's issued like that, when interest rates are kept really, really low, is you got inflation and you got a bubble. Sometimes you get them together, sometimes you get them separate, but usually you get them together. Inflation and a bubble. The bubble was in the stock of this company, a massive bubble, and inflation, inflation was... Um, just uh, prices started going up just generally in the economy because there was so much money chasing no more goods than they were before. Money, uh, people started converting these um, bills of exchange into gold and they started taking the gold out of France. The French government then banned the export of gold. That is, people were taking their money, gold, real gold, and putting it into banks in Amsterdam where they could trust it. And as a consequence, gold was flowing out of 
France, and all they were left was with fiat money, and fiat money was generating inflation. So the French monarchy made it illegal to possess gold. First, they made it illegal to export gold. Then they made it illegal to possess gold. And, and they would literally search people who were leaving the country for gold, and they would expropriate it. And, and this, of course, all led to the complete collapse of the system, uh, which led to a lot of aristocrats losing all their money. It led to, it led, uh, to poor people becoming poorer. It led to a massive financial crisis, a massive economic crisis in France, which lasted for decades. And you could argue maybe laid at least the economic, if not the intellectual seeds, but the economic seeds for the French Revolution that happened, what, 70 years later, 80 years later. Uh, so um, so here you got a um, fiat money generated, I would argue what fiat money always generates, which is inflation and bubbles, inflation and bubbles. And it's always the case that governments, you could argue, cannot resist lowering interest rates because the people demand it and printing money because the people demand it, because it's easy, because you can give out political favors, because you've got wars to win or whatever. And it always ends the same in the devaluation of the money, which means inflation or in a bubble that then bursts and results in collapse. The first use of fiat money, uh, in, it, it, by the way, John Law escaped. He made it to Amsterdam or wherever, uh, and, and, and he lived on, and today is remembered as a brilliant mathematician economist who gave us the principles of modern central banking monetary theory. Nobody learns anything from history. I keep saying that. This just reinforces that fact. All right, let's see. Um, next, uh, next point is first use of fiat money in the United States was during uh, two wars, the War of Independence, the Confederacy, the Confederate government, was that what it's called, it was called? It, it wasn't the, 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 anyway, the Union, the Confederate, the, not the Confederacy, God, that's a civil war. Um, the, the, <laughs> the US government issued paper money to be used uh, and they promised that it would be redeemable uh, after the war. Of course, it wasn't, and there had to be, it, 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 there was massive inflation. It, it, the paper, it was, it was the Continental Congress. It was, it, was, uh, it was worthless by the end of the war. And, um, you know, uh, Hamilton, and I forget the name of the banker, the famous banker, had to do a lot of um, financial engineering to try to pay people back, to give them some value for these people's pieces of paper with those notes that they have. But after the war, basically that system where the government issues money disappeared and the United States had a system where uh, money was basically issued by the banking system. The, the government said a mint, you brought your gold to the mint, they issued you co coins, but in terms of paper money, that was the, the gold was deposited in banks and the banks would issue uh, uh, paper money. That existed until the Federal Reserve um, Act, uh, Federal Reserve's establishment in 1914. Uh, so the second occurrence of fiat money after the War of Independence was a civil war, where again, uh, redeemability of paper into gold was, uh, was done away with. The government issued paper money. Uh, that resulted, of course, in inflation, if you will, in the value of the money declining significantly. But once the Civil War was over, uh, a gold standard was reestablished uh, as a private gold standard, as a gold standard managed by the banks, not by a central bank. All right, so this brings us to um, uh, the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Up until the establishment of the Federal Reserve, with the exception of the wars, money was private in a sense that you own gold and you had the gold in the bank and they issued you notes and you used the notes as money and the, the, the money was gold and silver 
And a lot of the monetary intervention that the government involved itself in the economy had to do with the convertibility of gold and silver into one another, the ratio, and convertibility of the dollars into those. So the government still meddled, but it meddled a lot less than it does today, um, and, and it had fewer tools to meddle than it has today. Uh, in 1914, basically, the, uh, the Federal Reserve was established. Basically, the Federal Reserve became the depository of gold. Banks still had gold and could issue banknotes, but it was the Federal Reserve now issuing banknotes, Federal Reserve notes, what we now have as dollars. Um, it, those are Federal Reserve notes. Then you had, uh, you had the Great Depression, which we can get into the reasons for it, uh, maybe on another show. Uh, you had the Great Depression, uh, and the, 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 as a result of the Great Depression and runs on banks and the failure of a lot of banks, uh, the, uh, the government decided to confiscate all the gold owned by Americans, individuals, and all the gold owned by uh, banks was converted into Federal Reserve banknotes, and all the gold in the United States of America was stored by the Fed in Fort Knox or whatever. So it was illegal. I don't know how many people know this, but from 1933 until 1972, I think it was, it was illegal for an American citizen to own gold. You could have some jewelry, but you couldn't own gold bars. You couldn't own gold for an investment. You, you could only go old, own jewelry. I know that's crazy, but that's reality. They literally... You could go to jail for having gold in your vault if you're having gold in your backyard. I mean, again, people think that we've lost a lot of freedom recently. We have. But we lost a lot of freedom over and over again during the last 100 years or 150 years in various circumstances. Certainly, the confiscation of all the gold from private citizens and from private bank accounts during the, in 1933 is one of the biggest violations of individual rights in history, certainly in American history. Um, and that is certainly authoritarian, and that was FDR's regime, and it wasn't overturned until Nixon. Um, the U.S. went off the gold system in 1933, um, and it only went back on the gold standard, really. Well, it, 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 it still held on to the pretense of a gold standard, but, of course, completely, completely managed by the central bank. In 1944, Bretton Woods was established. Bretton Woods was an international deal, global international deal, to basically uh, use gold as a basis for money for international trade, make gold convertible into uh, one ounce, I think, was $35 at a fixed rate like that. This would force the Federal Reserve to basically be run based on a gold standard. The idea was the Federal Reserve would only issue dollars based on how much gold they had. Again, $35 equals one ounce of gold. And, and this would, wor would work, the argument was, to smooth global trade. And it did. It worked magnificently. The, the, the era of globalization was started. Uh, the problem was, so this is the thing about this gold standard. Individual citizens like you and me could not convert our dollars into gold. The only entities that could convert dollars into gold were central banks. So if the French wanted to take the dollars that they had accumulated because, I don't know, they'd sold a bunch of stuff to America and gotten dollars in return, and if they wanted to convert those dollars into gold, they would go to the American Central Bank they would give the American Central Bank the dollars to make a central bank printed to begin with, and the French would get the gold in its place. The assumption is, was that this wouldn't happen because the value of the dollar and gold would be stable. What didn't they count on? They didn't count on central banks and central banks banking cheating. In the 1960s, because of the 
growing welfare state or the newly established welfare state, war and poverty, welfare, Medicare, Social Security, all of that stuff, as well as uh, a Vietnam War, the US government ran large deficits, and those deficits were funded by the Federal Reserve printing more money than they had gold. They were cheating. Gold now, I mean, gold should have been worth much more than $35. An ounce of gold should have been worth much more than $35. But it was pegged at 35 You couldn't exchange gold for more than 35 even though you should have. Gold was very valuable. So what happened is people wanted to hoard gold. Now, as individuals, you couldn't do anything about it. But the French, after all, it's always the French, right? The French figured this out. And they were like, I mean, all that gold that the Americans have is worth a lot more than they're admitting. They're keeping the value of the dollar low. They're keeping the value of the dollar high. It should be much lower because they've inflated their currency. They printed a lot of dollars, and therefore the dollar should be worth a lot less in gold. So the French started sending boatloads of dollars to New York where the boats would unload the dollars and give them to the Fed, and the Fed would load gold bars onto these ships and send them over to France. The other allies didn't do it because America asked them not to do it because it was clear that America was in trouble. But what you had is a big flow of gold out of the U.S. and into France. A great trade for the French, by the way. It got so bad that Nixon in 1971 or 72 basically said, can't keep this up. Basically, our gold reserves will go to zero. We can't have that. Um, and uh, so he basically went off the gold standard completely in uh, 1971. He floated the dollar, which means the dollar became a pure fiat currency. It was already mainly fiat, but now it became a pure fiat currency. The, the illusion of being uh, backed by gold was gone. And the United States since then has had a pure fiat currency. Oh, you know, as a consequence of the United States doing that over time, Every other economy, major economy in Europe did it. Then the Asians did it. First, they, 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 they didn't have it pegged to gold. They have it pegged to the dollar. And then the dollar was pegged to gold. So once the dollar stopped getting pegged to gold, a lot of currencies kept the peg to the dollar. But then once the dollar started inflating, they dissolved the peg to the dollar. And now all currencies fluctuate. Their value is determined one against the other by supply and demand, by the market. So fiat money is what we have today. It's, it's, um, it's uh, pieces of paper that have this status as money primarily because of uh, laws of legal tender, which say that the government has to must, accepts them as payment for taxes and payment for anything else, for loans. It also says legal tender laws say that you know, uh, it, that contracts can be paid off using dollars, using this paper. And it's acceptable that everybody uses it and everybody can use it. And it is, it is the money. It is the money. Money is the common medium of exchange as such in the United States today and in uh, the whole world. Uh, the dollar is money. The paper dollar is money. Not a good money. I would say an awful money. And if you ask me, uh, as David asked, is fiat money more of a curse or more of a blessing? I mean, I would say unequivocally, that is a curse. It is awful and terrible. You saw that in what happened to John Law. It doesn't happen quite to the same degree. Our economists today and people at the Fed are more sophisticated. But at the end of the day, it is fiat money that brings us inflation. The inflation we're experiencing right now is a consequence of the fact that the Federal Reserve just printed up a bunch of money during COVID and gave it to us. And gave it to us during a time where there was a supply shock. So the amount of goods was going down, the amount of money was going up. What do you think would happen to prices? They went up. But 
it's worse than that. Money doesn't just cause inflation. It also, fiat money. Fiat money also gives the central bank, and because of that, the government, huge, massive control over the economy. The government now determines how much money is going to be in the economy. The government now determines who gets that money, how they get it. Remember bailouts? Bailouts, anybody? They couldn't do that unless they had a printing press. But they have a printing press, so they can bail out anybody. The government can run massive deficits. I mean, think of the deficit in the United States, which means they can spend without thought, without consideration. It means that the Federal Reserve can, at its whim, increase the amount of money in the economy or decrease it. It can do quantitative easing, which it did through the 2000s. It can do quantitative tightening, which supposedly it's doing now, but not so much because there are problems with the banks. So they can't do too much quantitative tightening, which means inflating the money supply or deflating the money supply. It means that certain sectors can get the money, bailouts again, or just the way money flows out of the banking system into the hands of people. It means they control interest rates. Almost every economic problem, crisis, comes from a period of interest rates being too low artificially. It creates massive distortions, perversions, and, and misallocations in the economy. Malinvestment, as the, as the Austrians call it. Every bubble we've seen is a consequence, and every financial crisis we've seen is a consequence of some way of fiat money, interest rates. The control fiat money allows the central bank on interest rates. The Great Depression was caused by interest rates being too low in 1925 to 1929 or 1926 to 1929. And then probably money supply being too tight in the post-1929, but, but that's controversial, but there's no doubt that what the government did caused the, financial, the, the Great Depression and then sustained it in the Great Depression, all because they mismanaged money. Not the only thing they mismanaged, they also mismanaged trade, not accidentally. Trade is often related to money. It was the big anti-trade bill that Hoover passed. They mismanaged taxes, they mismanaged regulation, they mismanaged everything, which sustained the Great Depression. But a big chunk of it, and the reason it happened to begin with, was the mismanaging of money. Because money cannot be managed. It cannot be centrally planned any more than any other good can be centrally planned. Money needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to respond to economic conditions. It needs to be able to respond to market incentives. It needs to be able to respond to supply and demand. And because the Fed central bank controls it, it cannot. It cannot. So money in the hands of a central bank is basically money in the hands of the government is unequivocally a curse as compared to, I mean, imagine food managed by the government. Imagine technology managed by the government. Imagine any industry managed by the government. And you all know, oh my God, that doesn't work. That would be impossible. That is a disaster. No, but let's give them money. Money, that's easy. That's no problem. And what you get is a disaster. So what you get is boom and busts. What you get is major financial crisis like the one in 2008, which was caused by the Federal Reserve by low interest rates, by mal misallocation of capital caused by incentives created by government, which couldn't have happened if money was private and money was backed by something real. 
systemic risk is systemic because we have one central bank, which affects not just the United States, it affects the entire world, the entire globe. All right, so it's, that's fiat money. It's, it's money that the, 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 the central bank just prints. Um, it causes malinvestment, bubbles, which are malinvestment. It causes inflation. There's another form of deflation which is very bad. Deflation of just prices going down because uh, productivity is increasing faster than the money supply. That's good deflation. That's healthy. Wish we had more of that. Deflation caused by a massive collapse of credit. Loans being called. Banks not issuing any more loans. Money, the money, the amount of money in an economy collapsing because of economic crisis, because usually there was a bubble before or some kind of irrational expansion before, and now it's all collapsing. That is really bad. That kind of deflation is really bad. But that is what a central bank brings about. It brings about that kind of deflation. You see, during the 19th century, there was deflation, but it was a good deflation. In a sense, that was moderate, was consistent over time. It meant productivity was increasing faster than we were bringing in new gold into the economy. Great Depression is a collapse of credit because businesses are collapsing, trade is collapsing. Um, what else did I want to say about deflation? So that, that is all a product of fiat money. Uh, and uh, so I think it's unequivocally a curse. There is no balancing act here. The only blessing it gives is it gives the government more power, if you consider that a blessing.